Dominated by the historic Dome of the Rock, the old city of Jerusalem is a holy place for Christians, Jews, and Muslims. For Muslims, the Al-Aqsa Mosque is a site of special reverence. It marks the place from which the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven, making it the third most holy site in Islam. And it is under the custodianship of the Hashemite royal family of Jordan in a sacred trust that goes back centuries. Our family was the custodians of Jerusalem until 1967. Uh, the West Bank, including Jerusalem, East Jerusalem was part of Jordan. In 1988 or 1987, I think it was, we said that we will no longer represent the people of the Palestinian people, uh, and uh, they will represent themselves, and so we severed ties with the West Bank. We became no longer responsible for the West Bank, except for Jerusalem, precisely. And our peace treaty with Israel in 1994 recognizes, the Israelis recognize our special significance, uh, our custodianship of Jerusalem. And it still is under Jordanian, under Hashemite rather, custodianship. The mosque has stood here for more than a thousand years. For 800 of those years, the Imam preached the word of Allah at Friday prayers from the same spot, a minbar, similar to a pulpit in a Christian church. But this was no ordinary minbar. The Al-Aqsa minbar was known throughout Islam, and its fame went far beyond, attracting attention from experts and academics all over the world. Now, all minbars are sacred objects, sacred to the word of Allah. But this one has a very, very particular significance for two reasons. One, it's a magnificent example of Islamic art from the heyday of Islamic art in the 12th century. And secondly, because it has a really remarkable history. The story of the Al-Aqsa Minba is rooted in the Crusades. During the Middle Ages, roughly around the time that Britain was experiencing the Norman Conquest, the eastern end of the Mediterranean, particularly that part known as the Levant, seemed to be a permanent battlefield. In this narrow strip of land, Christian Europe fought Arabs, Turks and Kurds for control of what each regarded as its holy places. The low point, from the Muslim point of view, came with the brutal taking of Jerusalem by the Christian Crusaders in 1099. It was a merciless rout and absolutely ruthless, and it looked as though the grip of the Christians on Jerusalem was unassailable. From then on, the entire Muslim focus was on getting Jerusalem back from the Christians, from the Europeans. It took nearly a hundred years, but so certain were the Islamic leaders of success that in 1168, the warrior leader, the Seljuk Sultan Nur al-Din, commissioned a fine minbar to be made in Aleppo in preparation for the triumphal return to Jerusalem. This particular minbar was one of the most richly decorated pieces of sacred art, of Islamic art, ever conceived. And it was designed and made at the zenith of Islamic culture in the 12th century by the very finest craftsmen that could be found anywhere. In 1187, Nur al-Din's successor, the great Kurdish warrior Saladin, finally triumphed over the Christian Crusaders and took back Jerusalem for Islam. One of his first acts was to rededicate the Al-Aqsa Mosque and to install within it the celebratory minbar. From then onwards, it became known as the Minbar of Saladin, playing its part in the life of the mosque for the next 800 years, an enduring symbol of the Muslim triumph. Then, early in the morning of August the 21st, 1969, a fire broke out in the Al-Aqsa Mosque.
When the flames were finally extinguished, the ancient roof had been destroyed and the historic minbar lay in ashes. It was an agonizing blow, an unimaginable loss. The fire was started by a firebomb, and the Muslim world, outraged, suspected a Zionist plot. Restoring the damaged mosque was an urgent priority. King Hussein of Jordan moved quickly. The building was made safe, and before long, the magnificent roof was restored, its richly ornamented ceiling glowing above the worshippers once more. The minbar was a more complicated problem. How to replace such an iconic treasure? A temporary substitute was put in place while a solution was sought. The initial idea, to replicate the original seemed simple enough. But as it turned out, replacing the minbar of Saladin was to be far from easy. For the late King Hussein and his successor, King Abdullah II, it became a lengthy and far-reaching quest, one that was to last more than 30 years. It was a puzzle. The minbar was made in a remarkable way. It was made without any nails. And it was made according to sacred proportions sacred proportions to do with numbers. Numbers uh, have in, as it were, sacred geometry a significance, but they're not merely uh, quantities, but also qualities. Nobody in the world could find the exact proportions again because there was no record of it. First of all, there weren't any working drawings. There weren't any drawings of any kind uh, to guide the designer. But perhaps more importantly, there just weren't the craft skills, the woodworking skills around. There didn't seem to be those skills to implement the design once it had been made. The skills just weren't there. Almost undetected, the crafts of past centuries had vanished. During the colonial age, Western countries, especially European countries, started to export to Islamic countries, Muslim countries, Western factory-made goods. And that destroyed the traditional guild system. And that, in turn, uh, weakened the traditional crafts and guilds and arts and removed their socio-economic function in society. Of course, their spiritual function was still vibrant. But their socio-economic function in society was removed so that the guilds were gradually decimated. This realization came as something of a shock a wake-up call. Had the world really allowed priceless knowledge and skills developed over centuries to simply slip away? It was an alarming possibility, yet the picture wasn't in